Hi, I'm Dr. Jack Farr. I'm a knee preservation and cartilage restoration expert at Ortho Indy. Because of that interest, I've now developed further interest in orthobiologics. We're going to go over what they are, what they are not, and some of the applications today. So as an outline, uh, we're going to talk about what is osteoarthritis. I think that's the major application today. Who might need it? The background of orthobiologics, both nationally and at OrthoIndy, and some of the options that we offer here at OrthoIndy, ranging from PRP to tissue and cell. As we go through this webinar, I'm sure many of you will have questions that pop to mind. Um, I'm more than happy to answer those after the webinar. If you just go through to the chat feature, send a question in, and then I'll get to them at the end of the webinar. So our program, the fundamental goal of our orthobiologics program is to offer the cutting edge treatments, yet that these are bound by scientific principles. So it's based upon the literature and certainly not hype. So diving a little deeper, what are these orthobiologic treatments? Orthobiologics are natural tissue-derived products that orthopedic surgeons may use that will help injuries potentially heal faster and may even delay major surgeries. So this delay may be on the order of months and in some cases even years. It certainly does not take the place of surgery. The orthobiologic substances consist of cells, proteins, glycoproteins, and complex carbohydrates that are all found naturally in the body. It's just changing their concentrations and where they're administered. And when these orthobiotics are used, they may enhance the healing process by decreasing inflammation and thus decreasing pain, stiffness, and overall improvements in functionality may be seen. The key issues, certainly there's a lot of misperceptions and confusions about stem cell therapies. We'll get into that a little more detail. There's some ethical concerns. Uh, we certainly do not push these on anybody. Uh, we like to have this scientifically based and we're going to use what is the scientific terminology and not try to hype it out of control. There are certainly barriers to use. Certainly some of these are where they fit into the FDA regulation, but also to insurance payments, so these barriers are real and we'll talk about those. There's ongoing research. We're certainly participating in ongoing research now and have in the past and will continue. Reimbursement, this is an issue right now, although especially for PRP, there's a lot of research that has shown that PRP is beneficial, in fact, is more beneficial than what some insurance carriers allow, that is hyaluronic acid. So hopefully in the coming years, this regulatory burden and this reimbursement burden will change. And certainly you can't believe everything that you see on Dr. Google. So what are not orthobiologics? This is the big key. Everybody loves the word stem cells. It sort of uh, denotes that you know, you're going to have a very primordial cell that can actually make any tissue in the body. Um, there are stem cells, it's just the ones that we have applicable for ortho today are not true stem cells. In fact, the scientist who came up with the term mesenchymal stem cell, his name is Arnie Kaplan, he's a good friend, he's at Case Western still, and he's looked at this and he said, well, 10 years ago when I came up with the term, I could take these very primitive cells out of the body, so typically out of bone marrow aspirate, fat, muscle, there's other areas, and then he could manipulate these in the laboratory to form a variety of different tissues. So by that definition, they were stem cells. But when he looked at it, the way he manipulated these is not possible in the body. So what he did with his early research is not replicated when, the, when these cells are injected. What are these cells? They're actually parasites. They're around the microvascular, all these tissues in the body. So microvascular, there's a lot of that throughout certainly muscle, throughout uh, fat, and within the bone marrow. So these cells actually do work, but what they do is actually activate 
the patient's own tissue-specific stem cell. So within our tissues, we have little cells that are there to help initiate a healing process. When you have a cut on your skin, the body's gonna come in, it's going to start an inflammatory process as far, first part of healing, and then these cells through chemical signaling are going to call in these tissue-specific stem cells to help participate in the healing process. So these little cells, these parasites, can actually help jumpstart this healing process, but they in themselves are not truly stem cells. So the current use of MSCs, that is outside the FDA trials, and certainly there are ongoing trials. We even participated in one. We actually had cultured stem cells. We were trying to regrow a meniscus after partial excision. Uh, minimal tissue was developed, but what we saw in those patients, those that had some degree of osteoarthritis, actually had marked improvement in their comfort. This lasted up for two years in some patients. We published this in JBJS, which is one of the main orthopedic journals, we published in 2014. But as you heard, I, I said that we cultured, or the, or the cells were cultured. That's not allowed outside of an FDA trial. So in the United States, when you're talking about orthobiologics, you're not regenerating the meniscus, you're not regenerating cartilage or a ligament. Um, this certainly goes against what you've seen probably on Google and some advertisements, but I'm just telling you the scientific basis. So who might benefit from these orthobiologics? I think probably the most common use across the United States is osteoarthritis. It's certainly the most common subset of all the different types of arthritis. It usually affects more often the weight-bearing joints, but can, in fact, non-weight-bearing joints such as the hand, elbow, shoulders, but we see it a lot, certainly since I'm a knee surgeon, there's just an awful lot of patients that are suffering from osteoarthritis of the knee, and many of them are in this in-between zone. Certainly they have definite osteoarthritis on an x-ray, but there's still a joint space, and so they may not be ready, either radiographically ready or personally ready to proceed with a knee replacement. So how can we help them? We all know about weight loss, we know about physical therapy, bracing, oral medications, but many times all these things have failed. So that's what an orthobiologic uh, might come into use for osteoarthritis. If we look at another area is tendonitis and soft tissue injury. These are very common presentations to emergency departments, family physicians, and orthopedic surgeons, and there is a role for orthobiologics. It's an evolving role, but, but nevertheless, there, there is a role to help healing these types of tissues. We'll look at these first. Let's look at platelet-rich plasma. I think this is probably the most popular across the United States. Probably has the highest number. And in most situations, this is also the most cost-effective. So there's basically two generic types of PRP. One is, and it's really based upon how many uh, centrifugations there are. So if you have one spin, it's going to separate it out so the actual PRP, platelet-rich plasma, has very few white cells. So the same term PRP, if you have two spins, now you're entering, so you're having some white cells entering into this whole PRP. And you're saying, well, what's the difference? Well, um, in certain circumstances, inflammation is potentially important in initiating a healing type of process. Uh, you might think about a tendonitis. If you're thinking about osteoarthritis, we don't want to have inflammation. There's robust inflammation. That's part of the pain process of osteoarthritis. So we would like to diminish the inflammation. And so for patients with osteoarthritis, most physicians are using low white count PRP, and the evolving use of PRP in tendon type of injuries is still ongoing, and the science will hopefully tell us in the future the optimal type of PRP to use in each type of injury. We'll look at the other products that we have available. So we list these as tissue and cell therapies. 
And this is where many practitioners would use the word stem cell. Uh, almost all patients use the word stem cell. I understand what they're saying. I just do not use the word stem cell when I'm talking about our treatments because they're truly not stem cells. But we still have these cells, these parasites. And so you could see there's three main types, bone marrow aspirate types. And so typically we take bone marrow and that has some cells that participate in making new blood and platelets. They have other cells that can participate in stimulating other parts of the body for the healing process. And that's the ones we're looking for. So the bone marrow aspirate is concentrated again by centrifugation and we can regulate how many white cells and within those white cells are these parasites. So that's, that's why in some of these settings we're going to use a higher white cell so we can capture these uh, energized parasites. So you can think of the cascade of how many different types of cells there are across the body, but if we're looking at the parasites, what's really rich in vascularity, and that's adipose tissue. And so that's the number two option here that we've discussed. Uh, in this particular one, there's a lot of ways to process, and I won't get into the technical details, but the FDA is, is making clarification on how you obtain these cells. And so you don't want to alter the basic characteristics of the tissue that you're using. And so we're using fragmented fat and it's been cleansed. So this is from a company that has labeled this as Lipogems. So this is one that is now FDA allowed. And I think that's a big term that uh, kind of slides by. Um, FDA allow means they are allowing it for use. They're not going to fine anybody. Um, but it's not FDA approved. FDA approved means it has gone through a process so that there's some studies that the FDA has re reviewed and say, well, number one, it works, and number two, it's safe. So that's the big difference between FDA allowed products and FDA approved products. And finally, there's a lot of placental derived tissue. Um, without getting into the details of this, basically you have the amnion and chorion, there's some pros and cons of each of these approaches. We actually did a study, which we published last year in 2019, that showed the product that we tested, which is called Renew. It's from a company, Organogenesis, that I'm a consultant for. Um, so this was in a randomized blinded, so I didn't know what the patients were getting. The patients didn't know what they were getting. Um, and yet it came out that there was improvement with the Renew as opposed to a placebo or hyaluronic acid. So where is the current status of FDA regulation with these products? Um, what's the legality? Well, once again, I could get into the weeds here and talk all about FDA regulations, but the, the big concept is there's two different pathways that the FDA allows different tissues to be used. This 361 pathway, natural use, this is where it's FDA allowed. And examples that we've used in the past were like meniscus transplants, osteochondral allograft transplants, tendon allograft that come from a cadaver donor. So those are FDA allowed, but not FDA approved. The 351 pathway, that's if you are manipulating. And what is manipulation? Uh, an example would be culturing. So these cultured mesenchymal stem cells or parasites, that would be manipulated. So anytime you're doing something to the tissue that is manipulation, the FDA requires a randomized controlled study that they can then review and they'll decide whether or not they're going to approve it. So right now, the FDA is tolerating a lot of orthobiologics that in the future probably will fit into this manipulated category and to be able to be used, we'll need to have a true FDA approved trial. So right now it's sort of this borderline. And so a lot of products that are used now may not be uh, available. Originally that was going to be November of this year, but because of COVID, the FDA has changed that. And now currently um, this, this window of opportunity is until June of 2021. 
Now, with the unknowns of COVID, this may be extended even to 2022. So just keep up to date on what the regulatory status is of any product you might use. So are you a candidate? Who, who might be a candidate? Certainly the most common candidate that we see are patients with mild to moderate osteoarthritis. You're saying, well, you know, I have severe osteoarthritis. I've been told that, quote, stem cells can rebuild my cartilage and I won't need a knee replacement. Well, unfortunately, that's not true. What is true is for mild to moderate osteoarthritis, that means if you look at an x-ray and the bones aren't touching, a component of osteoarthritis pain is typically an inflammatory component. And so I have found that these biologics will markedly help when there's an inflammatory component. So if you have pain throughout the day that's associated with some degree of swelling, and then it goes down and by the next morning, that's a potential candidate. So they need to have some degree of joint space. Um, certainly we'd like to have something for people with bone on bone, but I have not been very impressed with using typically any intraarticular injections. When I say intraarticular, that means into the joint injections for bone on bone pain. That doesn't mean that a few patients might not have improvements, but they're not, um, they're not to the point that I, I feel that I want to have somebody spend their money on a product that may have a 20% chance of helping them. I don't, I don't think that's in their best interest. Um, most of the patients that do come to these orthobiologic injections have already had trials of therapy, weight loss, bracing, and even other intraarticular injections such as corticosteroid, so you've heard of steroid shots, or HA, or you might have heard of the rooster injections or the gel injections. That's all the same term for visco supplements, which is a generic term for these products. These are very large molecules that are naturally occurring. They have some lubricating, some anti-inflammatory effects, but unfortunately they have not shown to be better than PRP. And in fact, many of the studies PRP has been shown superior. And yet some insurance companies do allow for these HA products. What's the cost of treatment? Um, it, it's varied. Our, our prices, we try to keep them as low as possible. And these are basically based upon the kit. In other words, when I say centrifugation, that means we have to have a centrifuge, we have to have centrifuge tubes, we have to have different ways to process these um, for PRP. Same thing for redo, that's the adipose or bone marrow aspirate. So the kits dictate most of the cost. Um, the cost of the product, the preparation and the injection all are incorporated into one one fee and that fee will be written down and I, I think if you comparative shop it'll it'll show that, that certainly we're on the low end of the national price range and that's where we'd like to keep it because we'd like to benefit patients and we understand that it's a burden to having to pay out of pocket. So this is the end of the presentation portion of the webinar but you can still submit questions. You can go to the chat area and submit it. In addition, you'll receive an email about 30 minutes after the webinar is completed. And if you have additional questions and would like to talk to me uh, specifically, I'd be happy to see you in the office and make arrangements. Um, certainly we'll go over all the same information and ask and answer any detailed questions you might have.